Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Hi, Randy Kay here with the Heaven Series, and I have as my guest, Lisa Sharkey, and Lisa, it's great to have you on the show today. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, Lisa, it's great to have you with us because your, your account is going to move many of us to tears. And I have to, before we entered into this, I was praying just the Lord, just to, you know, just to speak to many people because you died from a heroin overdose and you went to hell. And so you have a message that's very relevant. So I'm going to ask for those who are watching this and uh, to invite uh, your friends, family members to watch this. It is not probably age appropriate for younger, certainly younger children uh, to hear this because it's going to be very moving. It's going to be very graphic and it's going to be about hell and also the salvation from that that um, that terrible, horrific place. So I'm not going to get in, in any more into it, Lisa. I'm going to let you talk to us about what led up to that moment where you found yourself dead and in and, and hell. Okay. Um, well, just to make a long story short, um, you know, I grew up, I grew up uh, in a, you know, religious background. Uh, my family and I, we were we were raised to, you know, go to church every Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday, and and so we um, we you know we we had a very religious background, and um, and you know I I had I had a very good life growing up. I made good grades, and I was in sports and and stuff. So it was uh, I had I had a I had a very good life growing up. Um, I think one major factor that affected me at a young age was when I was uh, um, on the playground at school, and when I was in, when I was six years old, and um, I was I was molested and assaulted by a, a group of boys, and when I was by myself on the playground, and they held me down and had their way with me, and um, now. Um, I ended up telling the teacher and the teacher told me I was a liar and told me I had to be in timeout. And so, for, for, so I thought it was all my fault, but I ended up telling my mom and, and, um, found out it wasn't my fault. And, um, the kids got suspended, teacher got fired and everything. So I realized it wasn't my fault and everything, but I thought after that, well, you know, everything's, everything was okay. Cause you know, when you're a kid, you're just like, oh, okay. You know, you just put it back in your mind and, and you just don't really, don't really think about it. You, you suppress it. And so as I was growing up though, uh, I started noticing myself getting, um, having a fear of men, having a fear of boys, having a fear of men. Um, and I know that like girls in school would be like, you know, have boyfriends and stuff, but to me, it was like, it's me, I was, it was, I was scared. I was scared, like they were going to hurt me. They were going to do things nasty to me and everything. So, um, so I, I grew up in school, not really having any, any boyfriends. And, uh, but I played, uh, I wrapped myself in school with just with, with uh, good grades, uh, lots of sports and uh, martial arts. My dad put me in self-defense and, and kickboxing and stuff. So that kind of stuff wouldn't happen again. And, um, and so, yeah, throughout high school, I just, I, I played every sport you can imagine. And then, um, and then that was when I went to college and, um, I began a female on female on female relationship with a woman. And, um, to me, that was who I thought my identity was, um, at first in high school, like I would have crushes and I would think, oh no, that's wrong. That's wrong. Cause I grew up in church, you know, I was like, oh, that's wrong. That's wrong. But in, in college, I was like, well, this, this is who I really am. I was born this way. This is who I am. And, um, 
but that didn't last long um, because she didn't want that for her life. And so that's when I left New Mexico State University and I, and I, I ended up coming back to um, St. Louis, Missouri, where my parents ended up moving. And from, from then on, I started, uh, I was severely depressed because I was confused about my identity and I started drinking and at the age of 20 and that's when I realized, okay, this right here, this is, this became, that became my God, you know, I was like, okay, alcohol became my God. So I started drinking and then at the age of 21, I started uh, going to bars and then I had somebody introduce me to gay bars and I at first I was nervous because I was just like I was like I don't I don't really know if I'm like totally like gay or if I just like was in love with a woman or whatever but when I went into the gay bar I I was like oh yeah this is my people and um, I still didn't fit in because I was feminine and the um the uh it was more of a i don't know how to explain it the men were, were more feminine the women were more masculine and but i stayed feminine and so i still got slack because i wasn't as as masculine as i should be so i still didn't really totally fit in whatever but i started dating started dating when i started getting i became a full at 21, I was, I was, a, I was an alcoholic, or I should say a drunk. Um, and I started dabbling into drugs, started dabbling into cocaine and um, started, uh, that became really expensive. So I decided to dabble a little bit into meth because it was cheaper and it would give me more energy. So I'd go to work and, um, and then that but alcohol was my main source, you know, because I like to party, I like to bar hop and everything. And so I did that for a long time. And then back in uh, 2016 was when I decided that um, enough is enough and that I went to a, a year long rehab. I checked in, I checked in myself because I, Randy, I was, I was in and out of jail. I was in and out of jail because of alcohol and um, DWIs, um, fighting. Um, when I was drinking, I was I was mad. I was I was angry at the world. Um, I hated myself. Um, I felt guilty because I was living um, a life that I was taught. Well, because I believed in God and I knew it was wrong, and I was living a gay lifestyle and. So I was trying to hide the guilt under uh, alcohol and then and then drugs. Um, but once I started um, quitting, once I decided to quit alcohol, when I went into rehab, um, there was people there that were like, well, why, why are you drinking alcohol when, you know, you could start doing drugs and it's faster, it's quicker, it's cheaper. And, and I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay, you know, and so that's when I started dabbling into dabbling some really some hard drugs. I started dabbling into meth, and uh, eventually started dabbling into heroin. And um, that's where that's where the ex everything started spiraling out of con out of control. Um, I, I became one of the, the drivers for, the, for the, the main meth dealer. So it wasn't like I had to go out and steal or do anything for drugs. All I had to do was just drive him around and I just give free, free drugs. And so, um, but when you were, when you're up all night, strung out on meth, then you needed something to calm you down. And so that's when I was introduced to heroin and now the thing was is I only experimented with heroin I would say at least five times which usually when you do it once you're addicted so uh the Lord had his hand on me but like um I was let's see there was there was a couple times where I did meth 
or I, I did heroin on my own without anybody knowing when I, I should have been dead. I slept for three days. So the God, so God had his hand on me because, because I shouldn't have been sleeping for three days, um, without being dead. And, um, so leading to, um, now let me tell you, there's so much more in between that, you know, you got to think of a life of, of partying, a life of drugs and, and people trying to kill me so they could have my drugs people trying to poison me because they wanted to have my drugs. Um, it was such an evil, evil, evil life, evil. I, I saw the, the worst, the worst of evil that I've ever seen before I went to hell, hell on earth. I've seen such so much evil. Um, but there was this, there was this one point where I was with a, with, who I thought, you know, you think they're friends when, when you're, when they're drug buddies, but they're really not. And so I was with a friend, drug buddy, and I had bought a bunch of heroin and, um, she, you know, I watched her do the shot and I was like, just do a little bit because I don't, you know, I don't do that much. I'm just dabbling in. And, and so, uh, she gave me a shot and next thing I know I'm sitting on the couch and then after that I'm on the on the floor in the kitchen and I she is just I I mean I can't feel it because when you're on heroin you're so numb you know because of the opiates are so strong so you can't feel anything but I just felt her slapping me, pouring water on me and saying, you're blue, you're blue, wake up. And I was still trying to come through. And I had, I knew what she was talking about because I had seen people and I have had, I've actually rescued people from, from, um, from overdoses and never did I think that would happen to me, but it did. And so she, she was like, you need to get out of here. You need to get out of here. Even though I was overdosing, you know, she was like, you need to get out of here. Well, she, she didn't want to get in trouble. You know, she didn't want to get in trouble. And um, so she was trying to kick me out of her apartment. And I said, no, not until you call the ambulance. And she's like, no. And I said, no, I'm not leaving. And finally, um, I started banging on all the neighbor's doors, call the ambulance, call the ambulance. And and praise God, somebody finally did. And then her and some other girl dragged me down. Um, it's one of the the, one, the worst street in in in, um, in Springfield, like the worst street. It's where all the homeless people are. It's where all the drug addicts are. It's where gangs are. And they dragged me to the gutter, to the gutter at the end of the street. And they they took everything that was on me and they just they just took everything off of me off of my body um and next thing i know um i lay there and i say i just start crying i just start crying and i said i said jesus help me jesus help me and as soon as I said, Jesus, help me, like, all of a sudden, like, I felt my eyes just, like, shut. When it shut, it got, like, pitch black, like, blacker than you've ever seen. Uh, blacker than we will ever see on Earth. And so it got black, and it felt like my body just left beside me it wasn't like it was like it was just slipped slipped beside me you know like my soul just slipped out of the, beside me and and then from there I was falling and it was a it was pure blackness I was falling and falling and falling and it was it was wide the, the, it was it was it was a wide space it wasn't like narrow or anything and at first, when I, whenever I fell, whenever I, whenever I um, came out of my body, I felt a slight breeze. I felt a slight breeze 
and I, I believe it has to be because my, because my, my um, spirit came out of my canvas, came out of my body. So I felt it because, because our spirit is so much more sensitive, you know? And so, but it wasn't, it wasn't cold for long um, because as I was soaring down, I felt behind me um, just wickedness and evil, like, like, a, like I was being pushed, you know, I didn't see uh, evil behind me, but I felt evil behind me. And I felt like I was falling down. I was falling and falling and falling and pitch black. You couldn't see your hands or your face. And the, the further I went down, the hotter it got. And finally, when I, when I landed, I landed on my feet. And when I landed on my feet, it was like my feet were like in a, like a, like a quicksand to where, uh, or like a, like a muddy, muddy to where you just, there was just no way that I was going to be able to step up and get out of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, the first thing that I saw though, uh, when I landed is I looked up, I looked up to the left side and I, at first I thought maybe I was looking at the, looking at uh, the sky and, but there was no stars. And when I looked up, it was, it was pitch black and like I told you before, it was blacker than anything that we've seen on earth. And it was so, the black was so evil. The, the, the evil of the black was um, that you could literally feel um, like just fiery darts coming in, in my pores, in my, like it hurt my eyes, it hurt my senses because it was so black. It hurt my senses, it hurt my ears, it hurt my pores. Um, it literally felt like just darts just hitting every every uh, aspect of my body. And it like, um, and you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to explain things to people who haven't seen it, but I, I try really hard to explain that the pain of the darkness was unreal unreal it was unreal and um but when i was there when i was i that's when i looked i looked down and i looked straight ahead and i would tell you i was like a little man i was like a like a just like really little compared to like two football fields away from the gates of hell and I was like, just, I seemed very far from it, but I knew where I was. I knew where I was and the fear, the fear of it was just um, beyond, beyond uh, explanation. It was when I, when I was talking in my other video, it's like the fear that you have like if you've ever had any panic attacks or if you ever like uh, Randy, you, when you said you had an accident, like, you know, the fear of right before you had the accident, imagine that constant state of fear times a billion, you know, that constant state of fear times a billion and it never, 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 never stops. Mm. And, um, and so the fear, I was frozen in fear and I, I knew where I was and I, when I saw the gates, the gates were wide, they were real wide and they looked like they were once black, but it looked like the fire from what I saw through the gates were it like was charcoal. It was charcoal because it looked like it had been burnt. So around the gates were, um, were ashes of, of, of charcoal from when the gates looked as if they were black at one point. And, um, and so when I, the gates were so big, they were so tall. And like I said, like I felt like an ant two football fields away looking at the gates. 
and um, if you if you can think of the most decrepit looking cemetery gate, you know, like old, 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 old. Um, these gates are probably old, older than you know, because I mean, come on, it's the it's, it's the beginning of time when, when these, you know, these were made. So it was so old and decrepit and, but you could see through them because there was, you know, it was, it, it's like you see through the bars, even though they were, the, the, they were designed, you know, they were designed, but you could see, and it looked from far away that the gates were really thick. And, um, but through the gates, I saw a large lake of fire, a large lake of fire through it. And, but the thing was, is the, the lake of fire, I could just see the shimmering part of it because it looked as if the, um, the, like it was a bottomless pit, you know? So you couldn't, it's like, you couldn't see the flames coming out of it because you knew the pit, the, the lake of fire was so deep that all you could just see was the shimmering, the shimmering of the lake. And, and you just, you, you, you knew that it was, it was deep. You knew that it was deep. And one thing that I, that I will, I have, I've only explained to you, uh, Randy, is because I've asked God, I've asked God, I'm like, Lord, I need you to show me what it is that I saw because behind, behind the lake of fire, I saw like stone, like, uh, it was like stones and they were, it was like they were burnt and they were falling into the lake. And when the more I researched, the more it looked like the the color of what brimstone would look like. So it was like the it was like there was stones, but it was burnt and it was crumb it was crumbling in into into the lake into the lake of fire. Like it was like in that scripture where hell hell enlarges herself every day. And um, one thing that whenever I was looking at the gates, oh, one thing that's really important too is when I was looking down to see what I was stuck in, it was, it was like a, a wavy, wavy, and I didn't, and let me tell you, Randy, that I didn't know any of my Bible, even though I was raised in church, I didn't read my Bible, so I didn't know any of these verses until, until the Lord showed me, but um, it was 40, it was verse, uh, Psalms 40, verse two. And let me, let me read to you because, um, this came to life whenever I was, whenever I was. I'll let, I'll, while you're looking for that, uh, Lisa, just thinking about your account, um, is absolutely striking and grueling and, you know, um, permeates the very soul and the psyche of anyone hearing this. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, it's important, at least from our observation, my observation, that you were victimized at an early age. You were uh, raped, molested uh, by a group of boys Mm -hmm. that had seeped into you. You had all the psychological um, trauma from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that triggered a series of kind of events within your own life, both psychologically, perhaps mm -hmm. physiologically as well. Mm -hmm. And you turned to drugs. So yes. uh, we're, this is, I know, I, I don't know if you found the scripture as yet, but we're getting to the point where uh, you are, are taking us through hell, which is a wake-up call, mm. but you're also uh, begging the question as to how you got out of hell, because obviously you are a, you are a very spirit-filled, just on-fire believer for Jesus today. So Amen. I'm going to turn it back to you for that, uh, that verse that... Uh, that you were Amen. referencing. God bless you for that. It was, uh, well, the, 
the it was it was Psalms 40, 40 verse two when when he uh, God says um, that whenever I, I told you whenever I was looking at um, I was looking at what what I was what I was sitting in what I was standing in and I was like I was like I, I can't I can't move you know and then so I re I found this scripture later on. In, in a Psalms 40 verse two, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. When I saw, when I looked around the, it was the, it was miry and it was pink. It was, it was clay. I was in the core of the earth, Randy. I was in the core of the earth and no one can tell me any different. And when I was, when I was in, when I was there and I know there's scriptures to back that up, but, um, there was, I felt there was no escape. There's no escape, but I felt like there was at first I thought, man, there's mountains above me. I could feel like there was so much on top of me that there was no way out, but in, in reality, it's not just mountains. It was like the whole world was on top of me, you know, and there, there was, there's no, there's no way out, no way out. And, uh, so yeah, I did, I, the, the miry clay, um, saw that and, um, oh, and whenever I was looking at the gate, I didn't have to, um, turn my head. It was like, I could see everything. I could see everything without turning my head. Now I couldn't see anything behind me, but I could see, I could see all the gates. I could see all the fire. I could see everything with just my eyes, just looking straight. And, um, and also one thing was, um, uh, it gets worse. It gets worse, Randy. Um, when I was, when I was, uh, when I was stuck in the miry clay, um, and I was thinking, okay, there's no way out. I felt so alone, never felt alone in my life. And I thought I will always be alone. I will always be alone. I will never be able to tell my mom. I love her again. I will never be able to tell, uh, my family. I love them again or where I'm at, or please don't come here. And so, um, it was then that all of a sudden I started re um, I started replaying everything in my life, everything that I've done in my life, every sin I've done and every emotion, you know, every heartbreak that you've ever been through, you refill it over and over and over and over. And you also, you, you replay of how many times the Lord has tried to get your attention to, to save your soul. And there was one point where, uh, and your, your thoughts are so loud, Randy, your thoughts are so loud. You're living, you're living in your thoughts and it's like constant screaming in your thoughts, like, um, beyond, beyond the imagination of how much your thoughts are screaming at you. And, um, and I remember at one point when I was reliving everything in my life, I heard my mom say, I heard her say, oh, Lisa, I wish you would come back to Jesus. And when I heard my mom's sweet voice, not only knowing that I was never going to see her again, I started screaming in my head and I just started screaming, I wish I would have listened. And as I started screaming, I wish I would have listened, my whole body set on fire. My whole body set on fire. And let me tell you, Randy, when your body's, okay, we have, we have our, our human body, okay? But your, our body is way beyond more sensitive. Um, our, our spirit, our soul is way more sensitive than our body. At least we have our body to cover up, um, you know, everything, but it is, it is beyond more sensitive. The fire is hotter. 
Um, and when I was scream, when I was screaming that, um, all of a sudden my teeth started gnashing. And then when my teeth started gnashing, they were breaking over and over and over and over and over. It was like nonstop breaking over and over. And I was screaming in my head and I wish I would have listened. I wish I would listen over and over in my head. And, um, but I could still hear my mom, you know, thinking forever, I was not going to be able to hear my mom's voice again. And I'm still reliving everything, everything that I've done, every sin. And then um, I started thinking if I only, if I only had one drop, one drop of tongue, one tongue, one drop of, of water on my tongue, then I would have just a little bit of relief. And that goes in Lazarus. That's in Lazarus and Luke. And um, I lived that scripture. And I thought if I just want just a little bit of relief if I just had one drop of water, because our body there craves water. It craves, mm -hmm. it craves water. It still craves everything that we crave on, on earth. Yeah. And we can't have it. We can't have any of it. And so we're still tortured by what we can't have there, you know? And you're, uh, the verse that you referenced, you know, um, speaks to the, the account that Jesus told himself, which is of the rich man and uh, who is in hell mm -hmm. and the beggar who is with Jesus. And uh, the rich man was crying out, uh, asking that, that Jesus would tell his relatives about hell and that what they needed to do to prevent themselves from going there. And Jesus said something to the effect of, I'm paraphrasing now, that if, um, if they didn't believe, you know, the prophets, if they didn't believe, mm -hmm. essentially those who had already declared God's truth, then they would not believe now. And, uh, and to your point, he was begging for just a drop of water. Yeah, I felt that. I felt that, Randy. I felt every every verse that Jesus has spoken is every everything he says is a hundred percent truth. And and then as as I felt that the now when you the longer like I Randy I felt like I was in 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 there for eternity. I felt like I was in hell for eternity when I was in there probably for maybe I don't know maybe four or five minutes on Earth. I felt like I was in there for eternity. But when I was gnashing my teeth and I was wanting that drop of water and everything, and all of a sudden I started crying out, Jesus, Jesus. I was like screaming at the top of my lungs, you know, Jesus, save me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And as I was screaming, Jesus, that was when all of a sudden I just felt just whipped out from the flames, whipped out from the flames. That's my Jesus. That's our Jesus whipped out from the flames. And I was in the, in the ambulance, which I don't know how the ambulance got there except for Jesus. And, um, and I, even while I was in the ambulance, I was screaming, I was on fire. And when I felt my, like, let me tell you one thing. When I was before, I, I felt my, uh, my arms peel, my arms melting off and I hear, hear my blood boiling, you know, and whenever I was in the ambulance, I could still feel, feel it, uh, melting off and I could still hear the blood boiling. So when I was in the ambulance, they had to tie me down because I was still screaming. I was on fire. And then there was the one, one woman who, you know, of course she looked at me like, you know, what, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, what is wrong with this woman? But she had to have believed after that because I said, I'm on fire. I'm on fire. Put me out, put me out. And she's like, you're not on fire. You're not on fire. And that's when I said, Jesus, help me. Jesus, forgive me mm -hmm. of all my sins. Jesus, save me. I repent. Jesus, I repent. And, and, um, she, she watched, she, she saw a lot and, and, uh, I would love to, I would love, Randy, I would love to get, to get that, that paramedic. I tried reaching out to her, but uh, to no avail, I haven't been able to reach out to her, but. Um, Maybe for, she'll be watching this. 
I or hope some so. program. I pray, we yeah. pray that in Jesus' name that, Jesus name, that she I hear this so. uh, account. I will remember her face. I'll remember her blue eyes. And um, I would love to get her side of the story. But it was mm. um, then when I pulled up to the to to the um, to the hospital, there was quite a few paramedics around me. And but by that time, uh, Jesus already had calmed me down, you know, after repenting that, you know, that I wasn't going to go back and um but for the longest time, I was just like, Jesus, please, please help me. I was screaming, I was screaming in the ambulance, you know, I'm on fire, you know, and Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me. And um, so I'm trying to think, make sure there was any, there's not anything else that, that I've left out. It seems like I've, like, uh, I've, I've told you uh, everything in, in detail, but it was, it took me a long time to talk about it. It took me a long time. I was, it was, uh, uh, I, I, repressed, I repressed it for a while. Um, Cause you know, when something's so traumatic, you just pretend like it doesn't happen. But then, but then I had somebody offer me heroin uh, after that. And I was like, you get out of my house. No, 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 no. You know, and it's because I, you know, I related related that with hell and everything and um and it's just uh i'm just i'm so grateful to be alive i'm so grateful to be alive and and you know jesus loves us so much that um you know he had he had mercy he had mercy upon my soul you know mercy and grace and and uh he um some some people say you know that he, you know, like, cause I, I was all in for the world and now I'm all in for Jesus. And I told Jesus, I said, Jesus, I am all in for you. You save me and I will do whatever I can, whatever you want me to do. I will do for you. I will do for you. Mm. And so what was the turning point? For, was it there in the, in the ambulance or after you had cried out the name of Jesus for Jesus to save you from that point on, were there any struggles subsequent to your there recovery? There was struggles. Um, I, I, uh, I, I didn't do heroin anymore, but I still was surrounded by a major, major drug community. And I was trying to, I was trying so hard to get out of it and it, as you know, like when you're trying to get out of something, Satan, because there's no such free, there's no such thing as free drugs. But when I was trying to get out of it, free drugs were coming at me. And of course I didn't, I was like, no heroin, heroin means hell. And so I was trying, I was really trying. I ended up moving back uh, with, I moved back with my parents and I, you know, I was telling them, you know, hey, listen, I, uh, I'm really trying. I gotta try to get clean. Um, I was, I was struggling. I'd slip back up, and then I'd be clean for a few months, and you know, and just keep doing that. And um, and then July 28th of 2018, um, my kidney shut down, and I was, um, I had a mixture of a drug called Molly and methamphetamine. And um, it's just, I was planning on that night, just going home, going to bed, but thing, things happen. And um, my, my body, my, my body shut down. And when my body shut down in the hospital, that was another thing where um, my, my body was fighting, like fighting like a stroke and everything. I didn't think I was going to make it. And um, then all of a sudden, like when I closed my eyes and like, like it's like slip, slip out from the side. And I was, go I was going up into a tunnel. Now, let me tell you this. This was a way better experience. <laughs> I was, uh, I went, um, I was flying in a tunnel and it was the most beautiful colors, colors that you don't, you wouldn't see, you wouldn't see on earth. 
and it was the most it was peaceful it was it was just uh joy and at first i didn't know where i was and um i saw a cloud but it didn't look like a cloud it was like it was like in gold and and i could see like bulbs of you know um bulbs of at first i thought it was stars i was like no that's not stars it was like bulbs and um and then when i was trying to trying to make it out it is when i saw the most the, the most beautiful as you probably you already know the beautiful light of god beautiful light of god and um subconsciously we had a conversation and i don't remember what he said but i know what i said i said i said but but god my family and then the next thing I said, but God, I've got work for you to do. And then all of a sudden I shot back into my body, into the hospital room and I jumped, jumped off the bed and went immediately into fighting, trying to fight a stroke, trying to fight, uh, getting my kidneys back to working and stuff like that. And I would say for the, um, I got better, but I, I remember for the, two weeks after that I was really depressed because I want to be back with Jesus I want to be back with God I was like man I was like God what why why, why? you know I, I was with you I was in, I was in your presence the it was peace and 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 joy and I was in your the presence of your of the, the most beauty your most beautiful light and then I and I chose to you know and so we had a conversation and he was like He's like, Lisa, you got, you got work to do. You got work to do for me. And so we had a conversation and I said, all right, Lord. All right. All right. I got work for you to do, Lord. And I'll do it. I'll do it with everything in me. So that's, and that's when I surrendered my whole life to him after that. So. And that was when you um, became drug free? That was when I decided... I said, Lord, I am going to surrender everything. Um, now, there was a couple times where I did struggle because I wasn't rooted. And so, but in 2000, that was in 2018, July 28, 2018. But in 2019, I put everything down. I said, I surrender. I put everything down. I don't want to try. I don't want to try anything. I, I even put like, medications down that I, the doctor had me on and everything. And I said, I surrender, uh, I'm all yours. And then I got baptized and then I got baptized in the Holy spirit and, you know, the evidence of speaking in tongues. And then from there, um, the Lord has rooted me and I've just been growing just leaps and bounds, just, you know, Lord, just equip me and I, I'm like obsessed with Jesus. I am addicted to him. I I cannot go a conversation without Jesus in it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fantastic. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, I mean every music I listen to, I don't I don't watch I don't watch movies. I don't watch I don't listen to secular music. I don't I just I am I'm very consecrated to God and I just want him to use me. I want him to use me in a mighty way. So wow. I, I've, I've had all, I've had everything in the world and there's nothing, no drug compares to, to Jesus, no drug, no, nothing, no person, no relationship, nothing compares to the love and of Jesus Christ and the peace that he gives you and the joy he gives you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, you're such a blessing and thank you so much for your courage thank you. to share this with us. And uh, I know that many will be touched by this, but again, this is, this is a message that needs to be shared to our friends, family, people that we know that are struggling with this. I know as a parent, I struggled not personally from drug addiction, but in, in my own family. And mm -hmm. drug addiction is a pandemic. Sexual abuse mm -hmm. is becoming increasingly more mm -hmm. of a pandemic within our societies mm -hmm. across the world. There is 
evil that has permeated all of the societies throughout this world. And we see it in some of the upside down sideways natures of what's going on by virtue of, of drug addiction, by virtue of sexual um, abuse, uh, by virtue of all of those things which are entering in to the person who's been affected and, and victimized by these things. And then they become uh, addicted to them. But, you know, I think Lisa, your story really speaks to the grace of God. He exposed you to hell mm -hmm. and, and he was giving you that glimpse. You know, there, there's that, I don't forget what the old adage is, but you know, that it scared the hell out of me, you know, was, uh, was kind of I, I mean an old that. phrase, yeah, but that <laughs> happened to you. I mean that. It scared the hell out of you. <laughs> and it's, I know it's, it's scaring the hell out of many of us that are just saying, you know, that, and, and, you know, many of us are uh, not going headed to hell. Many are, who watch our program are headed to heaven, but you would be surprised at how many people uh, communications and we receive thousands of communications from people who say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm going to heaven or hell. Mm -hmm. And you have a confidence, Lisa, that you're going to have to heaven, excuse me. <laughs> I have the assurance, you know, I went there after I died, mm -hmm. uh, but you have that assurance now. So I'm going to ask you to speak to those who are struggling uh, either from drug addiction, sexual abuse, or, you know, we, we've had guests on that struggled from all kinds of things, influences from the world, pornography, all kinds of things that are just have come at them and, you know, succumb to these, these different things for, for various reasons. Speak to that person who has not yet had that hell scared out of them yet. Mm. Speak to them with, if you would. Absolutely. Now, right now, there. I want to speak to everybody who um, has has listened to what I have said. Um, I have I have been through hell and back, literally. Um, I have been through rape. I have been through sodomy. I have been through molestation. I've been through so much trauma. Um, I have tried almost every drug you can imagine. Um, I was an alcoholic for 20 years, maybe a little less. Um, used to, used to smoke like a, cuss like a sailor, smoke like a chimney. Um, I even, I even delved into, uh, Ouija boards, um, uh, psychics. Um, there's just, there's nothing that that I can think of that I did, I did not do. Um, and, you know, and some people think that, hey, well, you know what? Hey, I hit rock bottom because I, I hit heroin or I, I've hit, I've hit, I have hit meth or whatever. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. We serve a mighty God. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth and he's a chain breaker. He's a miracle worker. And if he can do it for me, he will do it for you because God is not, is no respecter of persons. He is, he does not choose favorites. So he loves me just as much as he loves you. He loves you just as much as he loves me. And he will do the same thing for you. And all you have to do, all you have to do is just, is just ask Jesus, just ask Jesus just say, Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I, re I repent of all my sins. And I ask you, Lord of my life, I believe, I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose again and that you're coming back. And let me tell you, let me tell you something that's really on my mind that some people can say, Hey, you know what? I'll think about it and, you know, maybe, maybe tomorrow or whatever. No, you need to do this now because I have known people who have, who have said, Hey, you know what? I'm going to, I'll just do it later. And they've gotten in a car accident and they've died without Jesus. And Jesus is coming so soon. No one realizes it except for a lot of us Christians who, who, who study, who study, 
uh, deep into, into the word, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back and he could come any moment. And so right now is when you need to call out to Jesus because he will save you. And there's, you are not too far gone. You are not too far gone. It's a lie from the enemy. It's a lie from the pits of hell. And so I, I, I ask you guys right now to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And he will change your life. He will change your life. He will give you the joy of the Lord. Even when, pro, even when you, you don't, you're like, I don't even know why I'm happy because Jesus lives in you and you're happy. <laughs> He'll give you peace amongst the storms. And, um, and I don't want anyone to go to hell. I don't want mm. anyone to go to, to go to hell. It is more real than the conversation that we are having right now. This life right here is a vapor. It's a vapor. And the, the life that I saw in hell is more real. It's like, it's like this, the life that we're living right now is like a movie. And then you, and you're in hell is the reality of it. So I ask you right now to just ask Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior and, re, and ask forgiveness and turn from your wicked ways. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, come to Christ. Come to Christ. You will not regret it. You will not regret it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You know, your, your camera froze up a bit, uh, Lisa, but we're, we're going to keep, we're not going to edit that out because what you just said is so powerful and it came through what you just spoke and, uh, and it was absolutely wonderful. I have a, a word, if I may uh, share with many of those who are viewing or listening to this. Um, because many have not uh, gone through, you know, the trauma that you just shared very courageously, Lisa. Uh, some have maybe dabbled in, you know, uh, had too much to drink. Maybe they've, you know, smoked a, a joint or a few or whatever it is. But they would say, you know, I, I really haven't struggled with drugs or, you know, I haven't, um, I haven't gone through that, that same or similar type of experience. But I've got to share right. just very briefly that um, I experienced in, in my own family uh, very, uh, very painfully. Uh, and, uh, and when that happened, the Lord convicted me. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lord convicted me because he convicted me of me judging that person and my, my mm -hmm. beloved family member. No, I didn't think I was judging my beloved family member. I thought I was helping. You know, I was being, I thought I was being a good uh, Christian. This is before my heaven encounter, by the way. Mm -hmm. But I had realized that what I was doing by, by kind of speaking in a, in a condescending way, in a way that was, you know, you know I, let, me, let me help you because I, you know, I've not struggled from that. That kind of, ostentatious kind of, you know, almost uh, it was, didn't seem arrogant at the time, but the Lord was convicting me and saying, you know, you're, you're being judgmental. And I said, you know, well, I'm just trying to help. No, you're being judgmental because you're in this, this high position and you're looking at this other person in the lower position. <laughs> There's something then when I was in heaven and I'll just end with this, Lisa, um, the Lord Jesus uh, was speaking to me and he said to me this he said when you stop judging yourself then you will stop judging others i didn't realize that i had been a judge against myself mm -hmm. in a way that was um that was um unbeknownst to me in a, in a way because i had been concourse into that and i won't get into the details as to why but my, my reason for sharing this is all of us have fallen short. All of us have, have sinned. All of us have suffered from these kinds of issues that have pulled us into this world in one variety, shape, or form. It has happened. All of us have gone through that. And some of us have, have gone through it painfully within, by virtue of our loved ones. Some of us 
directly as Lisa has shared with, with, your, with, with ourselves. But all of us have gone through that. And so the Lord is, is using this, Lisa, very powerfully. What you invited um, people that don't know him, Jesus as their Lord and Savior, uh, that we, again, for anyone who has not made that commitment, pray that prayer. Pray, Lord, I have sinned. I have fallen short. And I know that you hung, you hung on the cross, not because some, the Pontius Pilate or, or the, the powers to be at the time forced you to hang on the cross. You could have caused legions of angels to come and save you from that. You had that authority and power. You hung on the cross by virtue of your love for each of us that pure, unfathomable love. And it was because of that, Lord, that you love me so much to sacrifice yourself for me. I now confess all of my sins, everything that I've done. And, and, and Lord, I ask that you would just forgive me of my sins against you and that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, take control of my life, possess me, so that I might live all the days of my life for you and give me the wisdom and the strength to do it. And for those of you who, who might have fallen, you know, you had struggled, you were sober for how many years and you've fallen, know this, do not believe the lie of the enemy that now that you cannot get back up and try. No, you get back up. And if you fall again, you get back up again. Back up. <laughs> Back again. Okay. You know, do not stay down or believe that you are unsalvageable, that you cannot be saved. Um, look at Lisa. Look at Lisa yeah. as testimony of that. Praise God. Lisa, you are such a blessing to me, to each of us. And I thank you so much for sharing this powerful and life-changing account. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I really do. If you, if you ever want to hang out again, just let me know. <laughs> uh, well, I certainly really will. Uh, certainly I really will. Enjoyed this. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. And you might be seeing Lisa on our new Heaven Encounters uh, show. It's a half hour show on the, the Sid Roth channel ISN network. If you don't have ISN, please download that app. You're going to love it. I know Lisa, I you it. watch that. Uh, Sid <laughs> Roth. So um, it's called Heaven Encounters. But uh, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, we'll have uh, information relevant. Uh, if you want to contact or have a message for Lisa, please go to randyk.org. The contact page will make sure that your message gets over to uh, Lisa. You can comment um, on, on this as well. Uh, and I know you, a lot of you are going to be giving just encouragement and thanks to, uh, to Lisa for having shared her story. So Lisa, we have to say goodbye until next time. <laughs> but thank you again. We've had so much fun. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, the, the closing statement that I typically make is if you are in Christ Jesus, be a good cheer because heaven is in your future. Until next time, take care and God bless. God bless you. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.